Well, first, I want to thank you all for coming. And uh, your presence here shows that, uh, in fact, this kind of uh, gathering is uh, very much worthwhile, uh, as organized by Multiversal Journeys. Uh, and so it is a very worthwhile enterprise, it seems to me, and I'm glad to contribute to this. Um, and I will try to make my best today to make your time worthwhile for being here. Um, so my topic is uh, on two-time physics. Uh, and anything that happens, happens uh, somewhere and at some time. This is what we call space and time. Somewhere is the space, some time is what your watch shows. Um, so in this lecture, we will uh, discuss the possibilities of how many space and time dimensions may exist. To do so, I will discuss uh, three themes, symmetry, perspective, and subtle phenomena. Symmetry, uh, as we go along, I'm going to develop these concepts, but symmetry is the concept that is going to put some order, uh, and then through the order, we are going to be able to make some predictions. Perspective is what you already know, so namely different views from different points of views. Uh, and subtle phenomena are the phenomena that once predicted, uh, they may be hard to notice, but they may lead to surprises, and they may lead also to tests to confirm or reject theories. So uh, through, uh, through this discussion, uh, what I will try to, to convince you of is that the ordinary formulation of physics in three space and plus one time dimensions is actually insufficient to describe uh, various things that two-time physics is beginning to show us. And then we will find out that one extra time plus one extra space dimensions, not only one time dimension extra, but also one extra space dimensions, are needed in order to provide a more complete view of nature. So, so this is how we are going to get a higher unified uh, view uh, of nature from a higher dimensional space and time. This little boy is my grandson, Isaac. He is at a stage when he is absorbing uh, an immense amount of knowledge, uh, like a sponge. And if left alone, over time, Isaac is going to develop the notion that the sun goes around the earth, rather than the earth spinning around itself and creating day and night. Of course, it took centuries to develop this point of view. It took 17 centuries, from Ptolemy to Copernicus, for humans to be convinced that the sun and not the earth is the center of the universe. And even this is not right. So the point of view of the earth being the center is natural because this is what we see every day. Uh, but over time, we realize that uh, we are in a frame in which we are rotating together with the earth and observing the universe from that point of view. And that is a different perspective than uh, being outside of Earth and looking at the universe. Uh, so eventually, of course, we learned how to correct for that. So namely, uh, by being either on Earth or outside of it, we managed to understand how is it that we should relate these views to one another. And so we learned that it was all a matter of perspective. And, and through that, we now know much better. And in fact, today we believe that we live in an expanding universe that has no center at all. So neither the Earth nor the Sun nor anything else is the center. Oh, this is going faster than I want. Okay. Uh, and then uh, this expansion of the universe actually is, uh, is not even uniform, and it is slightly accelerating. And this, uh, this uh, new discovery that it is slightly accelerating is what leads to the notion of dark energy. And I expect that the next speaker is going to talk uh, quite a bit about this issue of dark energy, so I leave it up to him. So, uh, so true uh, understandings of this type, and, and even much more than that, uh, eventually we come to the notion that the laws of physics are independent of the observer's point of view in space and time. So this is uh, what eventually Einstein formulated as what is called the equivalence principle. 
And uh, so the equivalence principle says a lot more. A lot, there's a lot more detail. And the way that this is formulated by Einstein is, uh, is this equivalence principle is a symmetry of the equations that describe, that describe space and time and gravity and forces. So in fact, uh, this invariance has the name of general coordinate transform. It, it is an invariance under general coordinate transformations. We will discuss a little bit later about coordinates. Uh, but it is such a strong symmetry, it is such a strong requirement, this equivalence uh, is such a strong requirement that actually it, uh, it, this, it, it tells us that this is the origin of gravity. Gravity itself is understood as originating from this symmetry. This computer is doing things that I'm not asking it to do. <laughs> um, so, in fact, the force of gravity exists because of this symmetry, and all details of the gravitational force is controlled by this symmetry. So, general coordinate invariance. So, I want to give you some example of what symmetry means and perspective. So, you can look at this picture of a temple, this drawing of a temple. So, we are accustomed because we grew up that way. We are accustomed to recognize that things that are far away look small. This is, we are already trained to understand that. However, on paper, sorry about this. On paper, you can see that, uh, you can see that something which is far away, on paper at least, is small. So, if you try to measure with a ruler, this gate, which is very likely much larger than the building itself, is looking much smaller. So perspective matters, and understanding perspective matters eventually. So uh, here we have a temple, and there is a single temple, but there can be many perspectives of the same temple. So you can look at it from that perspective right there, or from another perspective, and the picture is going to look quite different. So the fact that perspectives, different perspectives, may show different things is going to be applied as a notion to equations, actually, equations that describe our, our universe or forces or various circumstances. So, however, we expect that, that these different perspectives, they are all related to one another. They relate to one temple. They, they are all pictures of one temple. And we need to find out, we need to learn how to relate them to one another. So, so this notion is going to be useful later on in order to relate two-time physics to one-time physics. So let me talk about symmetry. Uh, to give you an example of a symmetry, consider the floor of this temple and the tiles on it. And, and uh, let's at first think, uh, imagine that, that these tiles, they are all white. They all are same uniform color without any designs on them. So I can take any single tile and rotate it by 90 degrees, independently of any other tile. And then the temple will not change. It will still be the same temple. And I can do that individually to every tile, and then the temple will not change. It still is the same temple. So this is a symmetry. So a symmetry is what you do to an object, and then it doesn't change. So this is a symmetry. And in this case, what I described is also a local symmetry, a local symmetry, because I can change each tile individually and independently than any other tile. I can rotate them independently than one another. So this notion of local symmetry, you will, I, I will make the point in a minute, that, that it is an extremely strong requirement uh, when you compare it to another type of symmetry, which is global symmetry. A global symmetry is now, let's change the tiles. Instead of uh, the tiles being completely uniform in color, let's put some design on them, some picture, whichever picture you want, your own picture on the tile. Uh, then if I take a single tile with pictures on it and then rotate it by 90 degrees, leaving the others alone, I have changed the temple. So the object has changed. It's no longer the same, the same symmetry. That I lost the symmetry. That local symmetry is no longer there. But if I take all the tiles on the floor and rotate them all simultaneously, this is called the global transformation. Under the global transformation, I get another temple, but it is again symmetric. So this is called a global transformation when all, all the tiles are being transformed rather than, as opposed to individual tiles being transformed. So if I require that this temple be symmetric under the local transformation, then that requirement uh, makes, uh, makes me have all the tiles to be of uniform color without any designs on it. So if I make that requirement, then I have a temple 
with only, say, white tiles. Okay, and no designs on it. So you can see that requiring some symmetry, which is local symmetry, can be very strong and, and require, require that the object uh, be of a, certain, of, 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 of a certain property. So once, sorry about this. Uh, now, once you have only white tiles, namely, once you have uh, perfect symmetry, then you can search for subtle effects. It makes it much easier to search for subtle effects. Uh, if there is an imperf uh, in some imperfection on the tiles, you can see it much more easily. Okay, so understanding that something is symmetric can lead to, uh, to, uh, to easily finding some subtle effects. So I will come to subtle effects in a minute. So now, substitute in your minds, instead of temple, equations that describe the laws of physics. And then, uh, in order to, to, to grasp the notion of symmetry, also instead of tiles, uh, substitute observers. Observers looking at the universe through the equations that describe the laws of physics. So, so uh, if I make a requirement that these equations are very symmetric, uh, then I relate those observers to one another, and then those observers will learn uh, that they are looking at the same laws of physics if I have such a symmetry. So we will be discussing about space-time and how space-time uh, has certain symmetries of that type. So let me describe a little bit what space-time is. Of course, it just means where and when. So in simple terms, space is, wh is where and time is when. So, uh, so what is position in ordinary space? Well, it is uh, given in terms of three dimensions. Uh, so, uh, and you need, you need three numbers, x, y, and z, in order to locate, let's say, a star in the sky, or, or something in the ceiling over here, or me in this room. So, uh, starting from some corner in the room, you need to give three coordinates, x and y and z, in order to find me in the room. Uh, so, we need three dimensions of space to be able to do that. So, what is time? Time is what your watch shows. And there can be many kinds of watches. Uh, so here are, here are some that I listed, but there can be many kinds of watches. And we can try to synchronize them in order to agree on the measurement of time. And now what is space-time event in space-time? So that is an event at a specific time and a specific place. And so in terms of coordinates, uh, we are going to plot, for example, time like this, and then space the three numbers, x, y, and z, and then locating it now in space as well as time. Not only space, but space as well as time. Now, what is a space-time space history? That's a collection of events, just like a movie. Uh, so if I take a point particle and, and follow its motion, uh, so this movie is going to be equivalent to a curve in space-time. So it's a curve in space-time. So that's a space-time history, and we call it a word line. So now let's talk about some space-time perspectives, and this will relate to uh, relativity, Einstein's relativity. So uh, uh, let's first talk about time dilation. So here are some astronauts coming back to Earth, and uh, one of them is saying, if Einstein is correct, when we get back, my car will have been double parked 320 years. So uh, what he's talking about is that on the ship, is measuring, let's say, something like one hour, whereas on Earth, people are measuring for the same event, then going, leaving and then coming back, 320 years. So why is that? Is because the time measurement depends on the speed of the observer. So even perfect identical watches may not measure identical time intervals. And so this is what is happening uh, in this cartoon. So this makes a prediction that uh, it is possible to travel to the future, like these astronauts. For these astronauts, uh, their time interval is only one hour, but they are arriving to the future of Earth 320 years later. So this is possible. It seems very strange. It is one of those subtle effects I want to emphasize about. And in fact, uh, it does happen. Even in everyday life, it does happen. If you take a plane and go to Japan and come back, you are a little younger than people who have not traveled. But it is such a subtle effect uh, that we don't notice it uh, with common speeds of everyday life. Are, those speeds are much too small to make uh, that, type, that kind of a difference. But 
In experiments with short-lived particles in accelerators at great velocities, velocities approaching the speed of light, uh, this actually does happen, and it can be confirmed by taking, say, short-lived particles, muons, for example, that live about two microseconds, uh, identical muons, one of them moving in the accelerator, the other one not moving at all, and you can watch them. The muon that is not moving at all has decayed in, in its short lifetime, and the other one keeps going and going and going, and it eventually will decay, but it will take much longer to, to decay. So that's because it is moving, and, it, and, and, it, and, it, and it is, it's being observed while it is moving. Its watch is moving, so that watch uh, does not measure the same uh, time interval. So more, pers more perspectives, uh, in, this, in this case space contraction, uh, to an observer approaching at the speed of light, Einstein and his surroundings, surroundings appear to be uh, tall and thin. That's because rulers, identical rulers, one of them uh, not moving, another one moving, uh, is going to measure, is going to look at different lengths. So that's why Einstein and his surroundings are going to appear as if they are contracted. Uh, so you guess it is because, uh, again, lengths depend on the speed of the observer. So these are, again, subtle effects. It does happen in our everyday life, but they are too small to notice. Uh, but with particles in accelerators that move at great speeds, they behave exactly and precisely in this way. So what we are learning is that space and time are not absolute. They are relative to the observer. And even more weird things than the ones that I have mentioned uh, happen close to the extremes of velocity as well as of forces. Uh, so for example, close to the speed of light, a watch appears to almost stop, like that astronaut. If he were moving at the speed of light, his time interval will be much, much shorter, as if his watch has stopped. Uh, this happens also in very strong gravity. So also in very strong gravity, uh, a watch will appear to almost stop. So further effects, subtle effects, inside of a black hole, time and space even appear to switch roles. So here's the plot time versus space, space versus time has taken the role of space. So even this sort of thing appears to happen inside a black hole. That's because of the very strong gravity. So such effects arise because, as I said, observers are either in relative motion or they are under the influence of gravitational forces. And previously, I was drawing my coordinates here, t versus x and y and z, in, uh, you know, at 90 degrees and, and straight lines and so on. However, uh, what actually happens is that the observer's coordinate system, they get distorted relative to each other. So one observer's, my, my, uh, uh, my own uh, the coordinate system may be straight, but uh, the coordinate system of the moving observer is not going to be straight and it's going to appear as if, uh, as if it is distorted. So the equivalence principle that I mentioned earlier shows how to relate them to one another in such a way that the observers, they see the same laws of physics. So this is how eventually we learn through the symmetry of the system that different observers, even though their perspectives are different and they seem to, they appear to be measuring different things, they actually are related to one another and at the end they see the same laws of physics. So we are going to use this notion uh, so, to repeat, uh, we are talking about symmetry, the equivalence principle in particular, in this case, that explains it all as being due to different perspectives, these this weird things uh, having, uh, having to do with different perspectives. And the consequence of the symmetry is that gravity must exist, must exist, and it must be described by the equations of general relativity. It is such a restrictive thing that it, it even uh, determines the equations themselves. It is so strong. And so once you have the equations, so that's like the temple, the perfect floor, okay? So once you have that, then you are able to make easily predictions and, and, and then also describe subtle phenomena that you can go and look for. And so some of them I listed here, for example, E equals MC squared, the Big Bang, black holes, expanding universe that you are going to hear about, and so on. They are all predictions of these equations of general relativity. But there is more to explain. So. For example, here is Einstein talking to his wife, or I guess his secretary since he was divorced. And, and he says, I can see uniting the concepts of space and time or energy and matter, but what corned beef has to do with cabbage is beyond me. So indeed, there, are, there is a lot more to explain. 
uh, it's not only space and time. So what happens, for example, to the properties of matter other than the history of matter in space and time, other than its motion? What, what, what are the other properties which we know about? For example, what is electric charge? Uh, what, what, what is the influence of non-gravitational forces? As I mentioned, gravitational forces, we, underst we understand it through this uh, equivalence principle, but how do we understand the other forces? Okay, so, so here is how we go to uh, space-time in higher dimensions. And this idea started already a long time ago with Kaluza and Klein, who considered one extra dimension compared to usual. Okay, so uh, they considered, you know, this was a, an attempt to try to explain what, what, what charge, electric charge, where does it come from, and where does electromagnetism come from? So in their view, uh, they took general relativity, the same equations that Einstein wrote down, except that they took them in one more extra space dimension. So four space dimensions plus one time dimension. And then they considered the extra space dimension being extremely small and curled up. So if it is extremely small and curled up, uh, objects that are, need, that are going to need to move in that dimension, they have to just roll around in that dimension and come back. So they are going to have momentum because they are, going to be, they are going to have velocity, therefore momentum, in that dimension. And then the amount of momentum that they have, that, uh, that momentum uh, is going to come in quantized amounts. That's because it is rolled up. Uh, but in any case, this is their explanation of what charge is. So matter, the same matter that, that moves around in three space and one time dimensions, if it also moves around in one extra dimension, then it has momentum in the extra dimension. And the value of the momentum in the extra dimension turns out to be the charge of, of, that, of, that, of that matter. And what is electromagnetism? It turns out to be just gravity. Gravity, the components of gravity, in this extra dimension. T try to take it into account in the extra dimension. It turns out that indeed, uh, the equations of general relativity, they yield the equations of Maxwell, uh, of electromagnetism. So in this way, it is possible to unite, to unite gravity as well as electromagnetism through the same equations by demanding the same set of symmetries, but requiring that the extra dimension is small and rolled up. So in modern uh, theories, string theory in particular, which so far is unconfirmed, the same view also emerges, but for different reasons. In the case of Caruso and Klein, it was uh, just, well, let's try and see what happens. In the case of string theory, is trying to solve a puzzle, a puzzle of how to marry quantum mechanics and gravity. So these are the two pillars, the two, the two uh, most important uh, ideas in uh, physics in the 20th century, uh, which are at conflict with one another, uh, in the sense that if you try, quantum mechanics works for all the other forces, uh, but it doesn't work for gravity. And because, because there is a conflict, you try to resolve that conflict. And in trying to resolve the conflict, it turns out you cannot do it uh, if, you, if you approach it in the same way, and, and then something has to change. And what changes is that instead of taking particles that have no dimension at all, taking objects that are like strings that have some dimension, when you do that, this issue gets resolved, but, but then it comes at a price. And the price is that it requires that there should be six more dimensions in addition to the usual three space and one time dimensions. So, so, so this solves a puzzle, but then you have to ask, well, uh, what, is, what is the meaning of what we are doing? Well, the meaning then is understood as, uh, uh, well, before I come to that, I will tell you the meaning. Let me also tell you that string theory is not alone. It turns out there are other objects, uh, that, such as membranes and, and other things, which are understood through string theory itself, uh, which, then, uh, which then lead to, to a notion of M theory. M stands for mysterious or something else, something really unknown. We don't really know what M theory is. We don't really know what string theory is. What we happen to know is different perspectives, if you like, of the theory so far. We have not discovered yet what the theory itself is. So we have not discovered the temple. What we have discovered is some perspectives, a few perspectives of that temple. And so the mysterious temple is now called M-theory. And then it includes string theory, but 
in doing so, in unifying aspects of string theory, it also needs to add one more space dimension. So a total of 11 dimensions, 10 space, and one time. All right, so, so here we have the one time before, the three space before, and then seven more, okay? Seven more dimensions that we need to add. So now uh, we come to the subtle effects. So once we have this theory, well, we are, we are going to have to ask, well, what, where, is, where, where, where is this extra space? So this extra space, well, we have to say, like Kaluza and Klein, it is very, very small. How did, it be, how did it end up being very small? And so the scenario is uh, that we try to connect it to the Big Bang and, uh, and then imagine, we, although we have not proven that yet, but imagine a scenario in which soon after the Big Bang, uh, everything was tiny at the time, uh, the extra space dimensions curled up and stayed small while the universe expanded and became big in the usual dimensions of time, of time, of time, and the three dimensions, but it remained small in the extra dimensions. How small? Well, that's the big question. We don't know. But it has to be small enough for us not to have noticed it so far. Okay, so, all right, so, uh, so where, where are these dimensions? Well, now let me redraw the same diagram in this way. Our own space-time, time over here and the three space over there, and, and then the extra seven dimensions. Let me draw them like that. So at each point, like this, at each point of either time or space, so at each point in our own space-time, you can travel in the direction of the extra dimensions, but you have to, cannot travel very far, okay? I drew this kind of long, but you cannot travel very far. You can curl around and come back to the same point in space-time. Uh, so, so they can exist, the extra dimensions can exist at every point. So I can draw this picture everywhere. So here or here or here, every point, at every point in our own space-time, the extra dimensions exist, and in principle, you can travel around. Uh, and so this is supposed to explain the charges of elementary particles, the flavors of quarks and leptons, the colors of, of quarks and, why, and, and the families the, that I'm going to talk about, and much more about the, these hidden properties of matter are supposed to come from the properties in the extra dimensions. So how can we find out? Well, we can uh, uh, make a tiny Christopher Columbus to go and explore such as an electron moving very, very fast. The electron is sufficiently small. We don't know how small, but sufficiently small, we hope. And then moving very fast can, in principle, probe, go inside the extra dimension, travel around, gather information, and bring, and bring the information back to us. So in fact, this is how we do experiments. So experiments, for example, at these big accelerators are tiny electrons or protons or, or other particles such as them uh, that travel at great speeds and penetrate deep inside matter, gather information, and bring it back, and, and we learn how to interpret that information. So we don't know, okay, we don't know, as I said, we don't know how small they are, and so we have to keep exploring, uh, and some of us think they are so small that we don't have an accelerator to be able to see them, and some others think that maybe they are just around the corner, and then there are proposals for, for how to look for them. So all that was extra space dimensions. So now we come to the topic. Why, what about extra time dimensions? So what, why is it that we don't talk about extra time dimensions? Why not, why nobody seems to? So it's because they are really scared of them, okay? People are really, really scared, and you can see they are trembling. Uh, uh, and it's because there are two kinds of disasters. Uh, that can happen when you have extra time dimensions. Even the one time dimension is somewhat troublesome, and we have learned how to live with it uh, because of, uh, by, by the appropriate symmetries. So what happens is that one of the disasters is ghosts. Uh, the name is, uh, is just funny, but all that it means is negative probability. Uh, as you know, probability for anything to happen is always positive. It cannot be negative. It's not going to have any meaning if it, if it is negative. But if, if extra time dimensions are part of your equations, then they create negative probability. And so this is meaningless. And so this is one of the disasters. Another disaster is causality violation. So namely for something to happen, something else has to happen. For example, for you to be born, first you have to have a mother and father and so on. So uh, if causality is violated, then in principle you can go and kill your grandmother before you are born. So that's another disaster. It should not happen. It should not be part of your equations. Your equations should not allow that to happen. 
And if you have extra time-like dimensions, it makes it much easier for that to happen. And so this is what some of the reasons why uh, they are nonsensical and they kept physicists away from contemplating more time-like dimensions. Okay? So how do we solve that? So how, how come two-time physics can advocate two times? Well, easy, of course, easy after the fact, uh, is because of a new symmetry. A new symmetry that goes beyond Einstein. Remember, Einstein united time and space by a symmetry. That was the equivalence principle. He also united momentum and energy. It's the same equivalence principle that unites them. And so the new symmetry is requesting, requiring that uh, the laws of physics should be invariant, should not change, like the temple was not changing when I make a transformation on the tiles, when position and momentum, as well as time and energy, are, are transformed into one another. Not just interchange, but, but in complicated ways, transformed into one another. And they become indistinguishable at any instant. Any instant is like requiring the local symmetry, namely that I can make such a symmetry transformation locally, individual tiles. So at an individual instance of times, I should be able to make such a transformation and require that my equations that describe nature should be invariant under that. So this is the new symmetry. So uh, why should I do that? I mean, position and momentum are very different notions, but not really so. Uh, they are not so in the formulation of quantum mechanics. They come at the same level of fundamental uh, concepts in quantum mechanics, also in classical mechanics, in certain formulations of classical mechanics, and also in, in, uh, in describing any type of motion as far as initial, uh, uh, in, in initial data for any type of motion. You need to give the momentum as well as the position independently. They are both required from the very beginning, and requiring a bigger symmetry uh, is simply saying that that the equation should be much more universal than a specific system. Okay? If I demand that, I'm going, to, I'm going beyond a specific system. And, and, re, and by requiring such a symmetry, I'm, I'm demanding something very, very strong, just like the equivalence principle was a very strong requirement. So when I do that, it turns out, it took, by the way, a long time to find this is a principle. It's now easy to state, but it was a long trip searching for it for, for, for quite a while. Uh, so now this wipes out the source of the disasters, but a requirement of that is that I must have one extra space and one extra time in order to realize such a symmetry. So this is where the extra space and the extra time is coming from. It's coming from demanding a symmetry. So here it is. So tell us in layman's terms what your breakthrough is. Well, certainly, and then writing equations. Of course, this is really the best way I can explain it, but I will try. I will try some analogies instead. All right. so, so let me start with this analogy. So here is a room. Um, I like the title here, Substance and Shadow, because these are really the concepts I'm going to apply to two-time physics versus one-time physics. So here is a room with uh, people in it and then, and then pictures like shadows. So the cartoonist is trying to make a social statement by depicting substance as poor people, admiring shadow as rich people. Uh, what I'm going to have to say have nothing to do with a, with a social uh, statement. I, all I just want uh, to, to emphasize is substance is what is in the room in the higher dimension, and shadow is what is on the walls in the lower dimension, one lower dimension, wall versus room. So the room uh, will be analogous to a two-time physics in higher space-time with one extra time as well as one extra space. And, th and those dimensions are not going to be small. They will not be the curled up dimensions. These are different dimensions. They are large, like the usual ones, like the ones in the room. And the walls uh, is the analogy for one-time physics in ordinary space-time, one time in three space, so fewer sp space dimensions as well as time dimensions, and then plus the possible curled up dimensions of string theory. So, substance versus shadow, and I will continue with this analogy. So let me make a demonstration with my hand here. Okay, so um, here is my substance, the hand, okay, and that's the shadow. Uh, now, if there were more sources of light, you would see many more hands, and then the many more hands are going to have different shapes. Like, for example, from a different point of view, it looks different. 
right? From a different point of view, it looks different. From a different point of view, it looks different. So the point is going to be that a single, a single temple is going to have many uh, perspectives, and they are going, each perspective is going to appear different. So this concept is going to become very important, okay? So a single object in higher dimensions, those will be my equations in two-time physics, is going to create different sets of equations in one-time physics, and, and those different sets of equations are going to describe different systems in one-time physics. So these different systems are going to have to be related to one another because they are coming from the same higher dimensional system. Okay, so um, let's continue. So let me describe this fundamental principle one more time. Uh, so it is a broader equivalence principle between the united position and time and the united momentum and energy, so, so a symmetry between them, and in such a way that they become indistinguishable at any instant. So this is a new gauge symmetry of the laws of mechanics. And it's applied to all motion. So as a principle, apply to all motion. So it's going to be a very strong requirement, and gauge symmetries of this type are so powerful that they highly constrain the equations that can be written down, and sometimes they fully determine them. Examples of that are, is that all known forces in nature, as we know them today, they are fully understood through, the, through some remarkable gauge symmetries of that type, and, uh, and then their equations follow from them. For example, the symmetry under general coordinate, transfor coordinate transformations, which I mentioned before, gives Einstein's general relativity, which describes gravity. Uh, another symmetry, young males gauge symmetry, this is for the experts in the room. Uh, so the symbols may not mean much to non-experts, but anyway, it's the name of a symmetry. It gives the standard model of particles and forces, which describes the strong, weak, and the electromagnetic interactions. So gauge symmetries can be so important and so, and, and so constraining that they describe everything that we know. And what I'm proposing here is a completely new gauge symmetry applied to the, all the laws of mechanics and applied to all motion. So there has to be consequences. Uh, uh, and then we will see what they are. So how does this work? Okay, how does it work? So let me explain a little bit of how it works. So the new symmetry uh, it cons constrains motion in the higher dimensional space. Okay, it constrains it so much that only highly symmetric motions are allowed. Not everything is allowed. So only highly symmetric motions is allowed because there is little room to maneuver because of the symmetry. So if the space-time has only one time dimension, these highly symmetric motions are impossible. They simply cannot occur in a space-time of one time dimension. This exchange of momentum and, and, and position, such motions simply do not exist if you have only one time. So the extra space and time dimensions are necessary in order to realize the symmetry, in order to have the symmetry. We have to add ex at least one extra space and one extra time. So, so this tells us we cannot have less than two times, so we must have at least two times. Um, but then, if you go back to the issue of ghosts, those disasters, if you go back to that, you find out you cannot have more than two times either. So we are stuck with two times only. So we cannot have more and we cannot have less. Uh, and the symmetry, for it to be reasonable in, in physics, uh, well, this is, this is one of the consequences. There are many other consequences, but this is one. So this straight jacket, this symmetry, in four plus two dimensions makes the allowed motions effectively equivalent to motions in three plus one. So all motions in three plus one can be generated like this from restricted motions in four plus two. Okay, so, so therefore we have to add, so to our own space time, T, X, Y, and Z, we have to add an extra time as well as an extra space, and now we are in a, in a space time of four space, W, and X, Y, and Z, and then T1 and T2, the two times. So what is non-trivial here is what I told you before. Remember the hand, a single hand giving many shadows. So this is what is non-trivial. So many three plus one shadows, many shadows in three space and one time, they emerge from the same uh, space-time history. If you take a history of a particle moving in the extra space dimensions, but restricted in the way that I, that I said, then you find that the shadows describe many different types of histories as if particles are moving under the influence of different forces and satisfying different sets of equations. So each shadow, each shadow ends up containing only one time, like we experience in everyday life. So each shadow 
contains only one time. And that one time is a non-trivial mixture of all the four plus two dimensions. So, so, they, so the shadows come in complicated ways in such a way in the shadows you have only one time and you don't have the two so you end up experiencing only one time. And so this is again uh, the issue of perspective that I was mentioning. It is similar, the shadows are similar to uh, many takes of a movie scene from different perspectives. Okay, so the issue of perspective coming here. So one higher dimensional reality gives rise to many related, related lower dimensional shadows. So here I have uh, the higher dimensional object, the substance, like the temple, and then one, two, three, four, five, and so on are like shadows of it in the lower dimension, like the different perspectives. And, and so, so, so uh, let me uh, make a small demonstration here, again, how if you imagine this being the trajectory of a particle, so moving, moving around in a circle in the space-time, in the higher space-time, imagine the screen to be the, lo the lower dimensional space-time. So this is my higher space-time, the room, and then the shadow is on the screen only. Uh, so, so now if I make another type of motion, like rotate it like that, then it looks like a different trajectory. It looks like an ellipse. And if I rotate it even more, it looks like, it looks like going back and forth. Right? So, so, so you can see how different shadows are possible. Even though there is a single thing happening here, like the temple, single thing happening here, but different things happening over there from different perspectives. So like that, we are going to be able to generate different equations in the lower space-time out of a single equation in the higher space-time. Um, all right, so now, how about physicists? Now, physicists live on the screen or in the three plus one dimensions. So physicists can look at these different things. They are different trajectories, right? Physicists are going to, that live uh, there and try to examine this trajectory. They are going to approach it only from the side and try to measure what it is. And they are going to think it's different than that. It's different motion compared to that or it's different motion compared to that. And so they are going to write different equations in order to describe that. So however, those different equations are going to be related to what is actually happening in the one equation in the higher space time. So this gives us a unification. Oops. Um, so this gives us a unification and explains why physicists uh, cannot, uh, cannot capture all the phenomena that may be happening around us, or they can capture them, but think that they are different phenomena. Okay, so, so they can describe them, but without, without having a clue that they are related to one another. And so that clue is the subtle effect. Okay, the subtle effect is the clue that two-time physics gives to the one-time physicist. Go and search for that. Go and find that there are such relations. So from the relations among the many shadows, it, is, it would be possible to reconstruct the full information in the extra space-time. So it is in this sense that you can go ahead and try to measure. So now, uh, something a little technical, and this is for the physicists in the room, just to sink their teeth on something. Uh, so uh, this picture uh, is right here in the center. What I have is just a free particle without any forces, without any requirements on it, other than its motion is constrained in, uh, by, by the symmetry that I mentioned of position, momentum, symmetry. So the shadows that come out, specific examples of shadows that come out, is a massless relativistic particle moving in the lower dimensions uh, and moving according to the laws of relativity at the speed of light because it is a massless particle. Another shadow is a massive particle. Uh, again, uh, well, it's different, right? Massless versus massive is different, so that's a different shadow. Uh, and this one moves uh, at less than the speed of light because it has mass. Uh, another shadow is motion of, like the motion of an electron around, around the nucleus, or like the motion of, of Earth going around the sun. I will come back to, to, to both of these. Uh, namely, a particle moving under the influence of a force. In this case, it was a free particle. In this case, also a free particle. In this case, it's a particle moving under the influence of a force. Very different equations as far as ordinary space-time is concerned. Here is another one, harmonic oscillator. The motion like the tip of a spring going back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. Totally different motion, but it is also under the influence of a, of a force. And there are more examples. 
uh, these are uh, interacting systems uh, that describe particles moving in various curved space times. This case is uh, for a particle moving in an expanding universe under the influence of an expanding universe. And this is another curved space time. This is another curved space time like black hole, not every black hole, but certain black holes and so on. So these are examples uh, and they are only representatives of much broader phenomena. Like this example is like, well, I showed you a hand and then we looked, we looked at, the, at the shadows. But instead of a hand, I could have had a person or instead of the person, I could have had a chair or whatever. So each one of those, each one of the systems that I start to look at in the higher dimension is going to have a collection, a collection of shadows that are related to one another. And two-time physics tells us exactly what those relations are and make those predictions. So one-time physics misses these relations if we don't tell them, okay? Because one-time physics is not set up in the first place to know that there are relations between systems like that. And, th and these particular examples that I gave you are already existing uh, systems that are related to one another. And a one-time physicist can either do experiments or can do computations to verify that what two-time physics predicts is actually correct. So now let's, uh, how, do we, how can we be aware that this is really true? Can we go ahead in ordinary space-time, uh, do it some, some experiment? How do we go around? To, to find out that, that indeed we live in a space-time of four space and two time dimensions. So I'm going to demonstrate that uh, by considering the hydrogen atom. Okay, how is it that we can go around, about to find out? Well, one thing which I should mention before I come to this is that the hydrogen atom is one of these shadows uh, and it comes as a shadow of a higher dimensional system in four plus two dimensions and the higher system has a symmetry of the extra dimensions, and then that symmetry comes as a hidden symmetry of the hydrogen atom. So by searching for this hidden symmetry of the hydrogen atom, we are going to be able to, to tell uh, that, in fact, the hydrogen atom is a window, if you like, to see the extra space and time. So here is hydrogen atom, um, a nucleus, and then a single electron going around it. And then if you make measurements on that, you find out, well, the electron is rotating and therefore has angular momentum. Angular momentum is a measure of how fast it is rotating. And also it has energy. And we can plot energy versus angular momentum. And then because of uh, properties of quantum mechanics that I will not go into, uh, the energy comes in quantized units. So this is one of the lowest energy states. It's the ground state of the hydrogen atom. And this is another higher energy state, higher energy state, and so on. So we are going up in energy, going like that. And then, uh, and then going, uh, going this way, uh, horizontally, we are uh, taking angular momentum, that is how much the particle is rotating. And so, for example, in this case, the lowest energy for, for it to be rotating with angular momentum one, well, is this one. Then it has a higher energy state, and then a higher energy state, and so on. So this part is going to be the most fun, okay? So pay attention. So, uh, so we, looking at the hydrogen atom, at first approximation, and then up, the corrections can be taken into account later, but at first approximation, we learn that there are four states here. One state with zero angular momentum, three states with angular momentum one. In this case, it is rotating and not rotating in that case. There are four states and they come at the same energy. And this is one mystery. Why should they come at the same energy? So one at zero angular momentum, three at angular momentum one, why do they come at the same energy? So the answer to that is going to be the higher dimension. So uh, let's see how we are going to do that. I'm going to use some software here. So this is depicting this energy state, this lowest energy state. You see N equals one, angular momentum L equal to zero. So this particular state, and it is showing the electron moving in and out radially, like a breathing mode. It is not rotating because angular momentum is zero. It is not rotating in that state, and its motion is just radial. So it goes in, comes out, goes in, comes out. So, so this colors, changing colors, is, is showing that. Now let's look at the next energy level, at that one over here, uh, which is N equal two, 
okay, n equal two, and then angular momentum still zero, angular momentum still zero. So now we are at a higher energy state, it is excited, and it is still with zero angular momentum, it is doing only radial motion. So let me look now at the other energy state, the one over here that has angular momentum, so angular momentum one, so now we see this is the x-axis, this is the z-axis, and this is an electron rotating like this, okay? So it is going in and out, in and out, in and out the page, okay? In and out the page, it is rotating like that. So uh, now we can change the orientation like that, and now it is rotating like this, in and out, rotating like this. And there is a third state, uh, which is harder to see, but anyway, it is rotating along like this. Okay, so three, three such states, which explains this, this three such states. So why are they at the same energy? Three different states rotating in different orientations is because changing the orientation does not change the energy. There is a rotation symmetry in three dimensions. Changing the orientation of whether it rotates like this or whether it rotates like that doesn't change the energy, and we have three states that remain at the same energy. However, the other state that I showed you was just radial motion, very different motion. Why should it have the same energy? Okay, so the mystery is solved by uh, saying that we have one extra dimension, one extra dimension in which you can also rotate. And so I'm going to demonstrate that now. Um, so here is my hydrogen atom. All right, so, uh, so it doesn't have to be really hydrogen atom, but anything that rotates. So here is something that rotates. And it's shadow, so this is in the higher dimension. Okay, and we are looking at the shadow on the screen, and obviously it is rotating, right? So now, instead of rotation, I want to illustrate the radial motion, which was in and out. Okay, so now in and out, let me rotate it like this. And if I, you see, this is like going up and down, up and down, without rotating, the shadow, without rotating. It's just like going in and out. So different shadows of the same object look like different motions, and so this is indeed the explanation. It is the true explanation of why, the, in, the, in the case of the hydrogen atom, the in and out motion, the radial motion, has exactly the same energy as the rotating motion. It's, and you can see it directly in the higher dimension. In the higher dimension, all I'm doing is changing the orientation. That's all I'm doing. I'm only changing the orientation. And changing the orientation does not change the energy in the higher space, including the fourth dimension. So this is the true explanation of why, uh, why these four states are at the same energy level in the hydrogen atom. And you can repeat the same arguments as you go higher and higher and higher in energy level and explain why these different states with different values of angular momentum, they all come at the same energy. It's all because of the extra fourth dimension. It's very systematic in the hydrogen atom. Indeed, it's got a window to look at the extra space in this way. But you can also look at the extra time in the hydrogen atom. And the way to do that is fix what happens in, 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 in space. Fix the rotation state. Okay? The rotation state being zero, or the rotation state being one, or the rotation state being two. Fix that, and then look at the connection of all of these other states. And then you can find that, uh, that the patterns of energies, as well as configurations of the, of the state, is, uh, is uh, the representative of the higher space-time symmetry, like rotating in one time, and, uh, excuse me, in one space and two times. So the, the patterns of symmetries, uh, the patterns of, of energy states that we get for the same angular moment with fixed space, uh, is that whole correlation is, is a representative of the symmetry group of rotating two times into one space. That space is the fourth dimension, and the two times includes our own time as well as the extra one. So the hydrogen atom is a very convenient system to, to describe that. So this is one way, a subtle way, in which you can understand that there are more dimensions to look at. It's one of the perspectives. There are other perspectives, and then you, no, you can go through the details of those perspectives and try to understand how, that, how it goes. How much time do I have? Um, Okay, so I, I would have told you about how you can also see the fourth dimension in celestial mechanics, in the motion of Earth around the sun. Um, that has to do with the fact that uh, it is an unchanging ellipse that sits in the sky, 
and why this thing doesn't change year after year after year. So it has to do with the same kind of symmetry. It has to do with the same rotation symmetry in four dimensions. And it is because of that this ellipse does not change. If it were not for the symmetry, uh, this ellipse would, ro would rotate and change around. So, so anyway, it is, the sim it is that symmetry, and I don't have the time to describe it. So let me go deeper into matter and tell you a little bit more about what two-time physics does there. Uh, so, so far I told you, Celeste, you know, large objects, there is a role for, for two-time physics. Small objects, uh, the, elect the atom, there is a role for two-time physics, and there is a role for two-time physics deeper in matter. So let me tell you about the structure of matter, uh, which many of you know about. If you start from an atom, you go deeper into the nucleus 10,000 times smaller, you go deeper to the proton or neutron, another factor of 10 smaller, you go deeper, and you find quarks, and we don't know how small that is, but we have gone experimentally up to uh, a thousand times smaller than, than the proton, and we have managed to, to well, see quarks and, 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 and see other things as well. Uh, so the quarks, together with the electrons on the outside of the atom, are representatives of a group of particles that we call quarks and leptons. So here is the electron, here are the quarks. They come in several varieties, they have different names and so on. These are the fundamental constituents of matter. So matter uh, is made up of these, of these objects. We have six quarks and we have six leptons and we have their antiparticles. So all known matter is made up of these quarks and leptons plus four force particles that hold them together. We don't know currently how small they are. We don't know their sizes. Experiments uh, are still being performed and, and it's not clear when we are going to find out their sizes. And we don't know if, if there is anything in these quarks and leptons, if anything at all, and then some speculate that it may be superstrings. So now the standard model of particles and forces tells us that there are four interactions, four forces that govern all the phenomena in the universe. And this is understood in the framework of quantum field theory. That's the computational framework in which we understand that in great detail and, and predict experiments. So, uh, so the, the, the four forces is gravity. Uh, here is Newton with the apple and, uh, getting on his head and then the strong force, which is the nuclear force and then the electromagnetic force and then the weak force. These are the four forces. The graviton is associated, is the, is the force particle associated with gravity. The gluons are the force particles associated with the strong force. The photon is associated with the electromagnetic force. And the Ws and Z is associated with the weak force. And they act on quarks and leptons and so on in various detailed ways. On top of that, there is also an additional particle, uh, so far unconfirmed, but extremely important in trying to understand where mass comes from, where mass comes from. So uh, this is uh, so far an unknown uh, 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 thing and, uh, and then it's the big thing that is going to happen at the LHC, at the Large Hadron Collider at CERN by the end of 2008. We are going to find out uh, the nature of this Higgs particle. So, so far unconfirmed. Now, this whole detailed picture, it comes out, the standard model, it emerges as a shadow, as one of those shadows of a theory I proposed in four space and two times dimensions. This is a field theory with actually an improvement of the standard model, which I want to tell you about. And then, and then the surprise is on top of this one shadow, which we recognize is, is the usual standard model, there are many more shadows which are predicted to be related to the standard model. So there are many predictions that one can go through and try, and try to do experiments with. All right, so, so far I told you about how two-time physics reproduces non-physics uh, and then it presents it in a new light and brings out extra information about extra space time. But do we learn additional new things? Do we make, can we make predictions? Can we, make, uh, can we find disagreements with one time physics? And then in order to do that, in everything that we have understood up to now, there is agreement. But in, in parts of physics that we have not understood yet, there can be disagreements. And here is one of the disagreements. It has to do with the properties of the strong interactions, which in order to preserve a particular symmetry, which is called time reversal symmetry, a particular particle must exist called the axion. Uh, so the, uh, the theory that, uh, that solves uh, the problem of, of this time reversal violation was proposed by a person who is actually sitting here in this room uh, 30 years ago. 
but this axiom so far has not been seen. So we don't know uh, that this proposal to solve this particular problem actually works. It's a, it's a problem that needs solution. Uh, and two-time physics gives a new solution. It's a new solution without the need for an axiom. And it comes from the property of the extra space time. So namely, if the, if the standard model is the shadow that comes from four plus two dimensions, then, then the axiom cannot exist. And the problem goes away. The problem is solved. Now, there are many other unsolved mysteries. Unfortunately, I don't have the time. So some of the mysteries include some of the stuff that the next speaker is going to talk about. And, uh, and also uh, what string theory has to tell us about, uh, so which is uh, so far unconfirmed. So string theory is a framework, it's not a theory yet. Uh, so, but to a few of these things, uh, two-time physics makes new proposals. Uh, some of them in not the same as one-time physics. So there is room there to test uh, one-time physics versus two-time physics. One-time, uh, two-time physics is much more constraining as compared to one-time physics is because of the exosymmetry. It is more constraining, and these constraints can be tested. In principle, can be tested. So there is a lot more uh, that one can talk about. So in conclusion, these two old Greeks are talking, and uh, one of them says, of course, the elements are earth, water, fire, and air. That's the theory at the time. Uh, but what about chromium? So the thing that doesn't fit. Surely you can't ignore chromium. Uh, so eventually, through such discussions, they discovered the concept of the atom. So similarly, you cannot ignore two-time physics. It's because one-time physics cannot capture all the phenomena. There are these more hidden, harder to see phenomena that two-time physics already is telling us they exist. So this hidden information is explained by two-time physics, and there is a lot more that remains to be done. We are really at the beginning of this game. There is a lot more to be done, a lot more tests and predictions uh, uh, that can be uh, performed. So two-time physics works, we know, uh, down to 10 to the minus 18 meters, at least. And through uh, work that is in progress, we hope to extend this domain of validity and solve some of the remaining mysteries. Thank you.